looking at the Harvey, the Fred Harvey Company, the business, and how they really branched into so many different aspects. And what we're going to look at and talk about today is their work with Native American art. Um, the way they used artwork in advertisements, the way they employed American Indian people, and then the collection that they purchased. So one of the wonderful pieces that we have in the Heard Collection is the Harvey Girl by Leo Poblano. It's silver and it's inlaid with, uh, with shell, different kinds of shell and with jet. And um, just a, a nice example of a Harvey Girl from a particular time period. It looks like the Judy Garland uh, Harvey Girl from the 1940s. Bracelet or ring? This is actually, has a little stand behind it. it. You can sort of see it in the background. It's like a little, little uh, picture in fact, uh, just inlaid. Um, so just to recap, and a lot of you, when I turn my head, you lose me, don't you? Just to recap, a lot of you are familiar with Fred Harvey, but just a brief recap. He came to the US in the 1850s when he was a teenager. He was in New York, and he worked in restaurants as a busboy and a dishwasher, moved to St. Louis, and then moved to Kansas City. And that's where he really established his relationship with the Santa Fe Railway. And he began by having um, a restaurant at one of the depots, and then later had the food service on the trains. Now, we all hear of how horrible the food was before Fred Harvey. And you can see from this train photo in the 1890s, what a lovely experience that would have been to dine in one of the railroad cars and have linens in China and in such a beautiful setting. Um, the trains, uh, the train, the Santa Fe Railway um, went from Chicago to Los Angeles in, uh, in the late 1800s. This photo is actually from the 1920s and it's in Los Angeles. But the trains had a big impact in many ways. Of course, uh, moving goods in a, at a more quicker uh, rate than before, all different kinds of goods, moving people, and uh, eventually moving people for leisure travel as well as for business. And it also, they also had an impact on, uh, on native peoples. This is a timetable from 1876, and it just gives you a glimpse of um, some of the, the brochures that were produced at that time. But Native peoples, the impact was more dramatic. Uh, this photo was taken about 1900 by F.H. Maud, and uh, the three potters here are all from Acoma Pueblo. You can see that the pottery that they brought to sale is really very beautifully decorated. It's of a traditional shape. It could be functional. Um, they have some of the water jars on their heads. The bottoms were indented. And so some of the first things that Native people sold to visitors on the trains were these beautiful functional items. Now this will change um, in a short period of time. Also, um, Navajo weavers responded to what they were seeing to the railroads. The Germantown textile on the right, those are commercial yarns. Um, they depict the railroad cars, and you can see that the cattle are on top of the cars. Well, they were not riding on top of the cars, but they were actually the contents of the cars. Also, the, the weaving on the left-hand side, uh, if you look closely at, um, at the wording on, on her right, uh, by her right hand, the words baking powder are woven into the textile, and on, by her left hand, rolled oats. So there were new products, commercial products, foods, things that were in trading posts, and uh, the wording was simply woven into the textile. This textile actually is, um, is from around 1900, and it's hand-spun yarns instead of the commercial Germantown yarns. So Fred Harvey doesn't have a lengthy, um, kind of a lengthy stay in the story that we're telling today. He actually died in 1901, and the business transferred to his son, Ford Harvey, who's seen here in the lower right. <coughs> and the photo um, of the woman with Fred was his wife, Barbara, who in fact was his second wife. And, um, and the, 
Ford's mother and other, the, other, the mother of the other children in the family. Um, one of Fred Harvey's daughters, Minnie Harvey Huckle, is credited with getting the idea for the, uh, for the Indian business and coming to the family with that. Her husband was John Huckle, J.F. Huckle, and he's seen in this photograph on uh, what would be your left-hand side. Uh, he's, he's sitting with Herman Schweitzer, who was the main buyer for the Harvey Company and who was also call, called the Harvey Anthropologist because he was so knowledgeable uh, with Native American arts. Uh, they're in an early showroom. We can tell it's an early photo of Herman Schweitzer. Um, he actually does become bald very quickly in all the photos. And so this is, a, <laughs> this is when he was young. And so it's probably around 1900. And there are interesting things in this photo. There's, there's lace. There are uh, Navajo textiles. There's a Northwest Coast mask on the, I can do this. There's a Northwest Coast mask right here. All these baskets and just a lot of different materials. But in 1902, in Albuquerque, all of you know this, um, the Alvarado was built, and it was really the main showroom and storeroom for the, uh, for the Native American art. This photo was taken around 1907, and it's a man with pottery from Santo Domingo Pueblo in front of the Alvarado. Now, if you visit the um, the railroad there today and the building that has built in the place of the building that was once there, uh, you really get an idea of the proximity of the hotel and restaurant and the Indian art building to the railroad tracks. I mean, it was just right there. You could get off the train, you could go into, um, you could go into the, um, the Harvey showroom, uh, you could go into the restaurant and have a quick meal. And, uh, and if you go to La Posada in uh, Winslow, you can see that same experience today. When they opened, and actually before they opened the Alvarado, the Harvey Company um, hired Mary Jane Coulter to decorate the showroom. And again, Minnie Harvey Huckle is credited with, um, with that association. Mary Jane Coulter had studied art in California, and when she was in California, she also apprenticed with an architect, and so she had also had a background in architecture. Um, she lived in uh, Minneapolis, and she, after her studies in California, she moved back to Minnesota, and she taught mechanical drawing, what was then called mechanical drawing at a high school. So in 1902, she decorated the first Harvey Company interior. Now, the, the showroom was really quite um, marvelous, and it was quite clever on many levels. As a visitor, you would walk into this fabulous showroom, you would get an idea of how you could go home and decorate a corner of your house or a cabin, or if you were Lewis Comfort Tiffany, an entire room with American Indian art just from seeing these examples. And then you pass through an area where there are artist demonstrators, and then you ended up in a shop. It's the model that museums use today and have used for some time. <laughs> so the really fun thing when we start looking back at some of the photographs, and the Harvey Company and the Santa Fe Railway were so prolific with postcards and books and uh, photos and paintings that they sold and just to entice people to travel west. We get a sense of how the photos were staged. The, uh, the, this beautiful jar, the Santa Domingo jar, which fortunately for us is in the Herb Museum collection, you can see here in the photo of this postcard from the early 1900s. And they just wanted, they liked it so much they put it in another setting in a different postcard. And they published a lot of these postcards. We'll see one of the newsstands in a minute to give you an idea of how that looked. So I did mention um, artist demonstrators. This was something um, that was very prevalent at the World's Fairs, um, beginning as early as 1893 at many of the World's Fairs. And again, we think that this was a model that the Harvey Company used when they developed the Alvarado. 
Um, these three women were um, weaving Apache baskets. They, we know that they were at the Alvarado in 1903 because there was a lot of publicity. And if you go back through the Albuquerque newspapers, uh, the Harvey Company was very good at getting publicity um, and having uh, accounts of people who were coming to do artist demonstrations. Unfortunately, they don't mention the names of these weavers, and uh, so that information is still lost today. The basket is just one of those beautiful examples of an Apache basket that's in the Heard Museum collection. So in 1904, um, well, the Harvey Company had a lot of um, a lot of associations with other anthropologists and collectors of the day. For a period of time, the curator from the Field Museum worked for the Harvey Company, uh, worked in the private sector from 1903 to 1904, uh, George Dorsey. And uh, Dr. Dorsey connected the Harvey Company with other people who were collecting and building collections. And one was John Hudson, who was a medical doctor who lived in Northern California near Ukiah. His mother-in-law, Helen Carpenter, collected pomo baskets. And his wife was a painter, and the two of them collected baskets as well. <coughs> Through Hudson, it was possible for the Harvey Company to arrange to have William and Mary Benson demonstrate weaving and the making of other cultural crafts on their way to the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in St. Louis in 1904. And you can see them here in this photo. This basket is attributed to Mary Benson because of its design as well as the basketry start. It was not finished. It's very large. It's like, you know, this big. Um, it was never finished, and it shows up in these early photos. Here it is. And it's hiding here by the fern. Um, just one of those wonderful examples. And there are some things that have also been associated with William Benson that are now in the, in the museum collection. And the collection totals about 4,500 objects. It was donated to the herd uh, in 1978 and has been uh, one that we utilize uh, repeatedly uh, in exhibits. So the photo in the upper left is a photograph of John Hudson's baskets that he collected, as well as uh, his mother-in-law, Helen Carpenter. These came to the Alvarado, and uh, Dorsey, who was, uh, George Dorsey was working both for the field and the Fred Harvey Company, made a selection for the Field Museum as well, and the Harvey Company kept and sold some, and they retained quite a few in the collection. So this basket is here in the photo, and it also has been attributed to Mary Benson by the weave and by the basketry start. The collections um, that the Harvey Company uh, held and maintained uh, were just wonderful examples. Uh, some of them were purchased uh, from private collectors, some from middlemen who were buying and selling, and some from the artists themselves. The Zuni pottery jar in uh, the upper left-hand corner is a Kiakwa polychrome from uh, the mid-1800s, or earlier, 1830 to 1850. And it's just a beautiful example of a historic ceramic. The Hopi jar in the uh, right-hand corner is, uh, would have been contemporary at the time, from around 1905, 1910, something like that. So that gives you an example of the range of material they were buying. And they also <coughs> bought um, and competed with others to buy existing collections uh, when they became available. The basket in the upper right is a Panamint basket. It was collected by um, you know, Helen Stewart. She was kind of a pioneer in Nevada and was um, collected extensively uh, baskets from that area. And uh, the Harvey Company acquired that after she passed away in 1927. The basket in the lower left is a Yokut's basket from California. And it also was purchased after the, the collector passed away. His name was E.L. McLeod, 
and this was purchased around 1912. Um, Huckle was not present in Albuquerque for long periods of time. He was there uh, in the early, when it first opened, uh, but he lived in Kansas City. And Herman Schweitzer was the buyer who was there in, in uh, Albuquerque. Huckle would write to Herman Schweitzer periodically, just encouraging him to go out and buy collections. Um, when, when they bought large collections, like Hudson's collection, both collection of Hopi material, and they also bought Northwest Coast material, they would get the people who were collecting to write descriptive um, pages, sort of like we would do cataloging today, but a little briefer. And then they, uh, the Harvey Company would attempt to sell those to natural history museums. Uh, some went to the American Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, others went to the university. Well, they tried to sell to the University Museum in Philadelphia, and they also tried to sell to the Carnegie in Pittsburgh. And then there were um, baskets that May Heard purchased, and jewelry, and textiles. And she, uh, the Heard Museum opened in 1929, so she was doing a lot of her collecting prior to that. Uh, May and Dwight Heard moved to Phoenix in 1898, but she continued to add to the collection, and she bought the Chumash basket on the left-hand side in, um, in the 1930s, early 1930s. Uh, the Apache basket is just a beautiful example. Now, jewelry. I want to dispel everything you've ever heard about Fred Harvey jewelry. <laughs> the, the Harvey Company collection has about a thousand pieces of beautiful silverwork with incredible turquoise, handmade, and just beautifully done. Now, the, the businesses also sold machine-made tourist jewelry with arrows and with uh, symbols and dogs and things like that. It's not really what we see in, in the permanent collection. This bracelet is by Fred Peshlikai. All of those little silver drops were made by heating silver and getting it to go into a little ball and then applicating it. Uh, applique wire, and the stones are just beautifully matched. So in some, to some extent, and, and to a great extent, because when um, Herman Schweitzer was interviewed by John Adair in, in the 1940s, uh, he indicated that the Harvey Company in 1899 asked for lighter weight jewelry. Well, this was true, but it didn't necessarily convert to machine-made jewelry. So the, the jewelry that was sold uh, and made. Uh, a lot of it was just beautifully done like this, handmade. And the Harvey Company also had a silversmith, usually at the Alvarado and usually at the Grand Canyon, to demonstrate making, the making of uh, silverwork. Um, this is a photograph in front of the Alvarado. Um, don't remember the date right now, early 1900s. <laughs> But I put this in because of the sign that was above the entrance of the Zuni knife wing bird. Just to give you an idea of how the Harvey Company uh, utilized American Indian designs in the publications that they did. And I just had to put in that beautiful um, inlay box at the same time. But um, as I mentioned, they were prolific in literature, sometimes it was the same writing in every uh, publication, but the, brochure, the cover might look different each time. Um, also, um, Herman Schweitzer traveled to Abo and, um, and saw a design of a Thunderbird uh, painted there on the walls. And they, uh, Harvey Company copyrighted this design in 1909. They used it on their letterhead, and they had um, brooches made, uh, like the one on the left-hand side. And you can see the funny thing about this uh, is the way the silversmith looked at this, but they did their own concept. With the, instead of the squares in the, in the wings, they added a smaller image of the bird, and they've got a, you know, kind of a step design there and the Santa Fe Railway, because of that close partnership with the Harvey Company, used the design as well.
So as early as 1903, um, actually the first uh, Santa Fe Railway uh, individual to be involved with advertising was C.A. Higgins. And as early as 1892, the Santa Fe was writing booklets about the Grand Canyon and promoting travel to the Grand Canyon. The train didn't go there at that time. But they also, the Santa Fe sponsored uh, wagon train trips to the canyon. You could go for seven, several days from Williams. Um, this is a very interesting example of some of their literature. Uh, Higgins passed away in 1900, and then uh, William Simpson took over advertising for the Santa Fe. And you start to see more of an incorporation of American Indian imagery in their, um, in their brochures. So essentially what they've done here is they have a photo or, or an image, a drawing of a Pueblo man, and they've taken a traditional um, textile and incorporated that design into their brochure. Um, and they've used a lot of images of, of women and children uh, and encouraging travel um, to the Southwest and all the way to California. Really, the idea was to get you on the train and take you as far as you could toward California. There were a lot of photographs taken, and you can see how the pottery has changed now. The, the pottery is much smaller. It's made for sale. It's very portable. And the interesting thing about this photograph is um, there are a lot of postcards that were published. So in this postcard, here are two conductors. Um, well, someone wanted more native potters, so they just painted in the images of those two little girls here. And also the potters are all approaching the train, so they have them facing out to make the postcard a little more interesting. Um, Carl Moon took a lot of photographs of native peoples. This is Marie Chawiwi, um, who lived in Isleta. Her parents were actually born at Laguna, uh, Dwight Landman has done some research uh, regarding her family. Uh, another photo, a hand-tinted photo, and these things were sold as mementos. And here she is with um, pottery she was making. She actually had a shop in later years, and her, her name is above her shop. But you could get a, um, a postcard that showed the Harvey Company and all the hotels, and you could mark your route with a little, uh, a little mark uh, in these spots, and you could show which ones you visited. Um, again, booklets often uh, used, uh, talked about Native peoples of the Southwest, used images of people of the Southwest. Postcards did the same all encouraging travel to the West. And this is one of many um, photos of the newsstands that were taken. It appears that they took a lot of these photos all at the same time because this, this, these women um, somehow playing leapfrog and smoking cigarettes was an activity that was, was occurring. But this, this appears in, uh, there are just several, I don't know, almost 20 different images and uh, the cigarettes were sold, cigars, but you can see here um, jewelry was sold in this one as well. And in this image of a stand, the, the book, uh, which was the third version of um, this publication, can be seen here on the newsstand and here, along with the magazines and, of course, the Lucky Strikes uh, cigarette sign. And this gives you an idea. Um, these books, um, First Families, um, all had the same contents, but they would republish them with a, a, different, um, a different cover. <laughs> and the Great Southwest, they, re they published several, uh, several times as well. Uh, George Dorsey wrote the book Indians of the Southwest. He starts out talking about Plains Indians. It was a topic he knew, an area he researched. It's not really sure how it fits with Indians of the Southwest, but um, he knew it, and that's what he did. And um, The Titan of Chasms was one that was written by, um, I think the text was written by Higgins and just reprinted 
again and again with different covers. The Harvey Company knew how to create an attraction. All these people sitting at the Alvarado. This was in 1926 when the child uh, actor Jackie Coogan came to town. And they, they did a, a kind of a ceremony with some Navajo medicine men and he was to become a, an honorary uh, uh, child something. But um, <laughs> it, just the, the number of people that they could get to show up at an event, they, they definitely knew how to do that. So in 190, I think it was early 1906, the El Tavar opened at the Grand Canyon. This is a later photo because the touring cars are there. Uh, and in, uh, oh, um, the Santa Fe and the Harvey Company did not exclusively use American Indian imagery. Um, the Santa Fe offered free passage to um, artists who would travel on the train, stay at the Harvey facilities, and uh, then the Santa Fe would get paintings. So this painting by Lewis Aiken, which was used on the, the front and back cover of this book, The Grand Canyon, also used on uh, matchboxes. This was in the uh, corporate collection of the Santa Fe Railway. But in 1905 and uh, preparations in 1904, uh, Mary Jane Coulter designed uh, her first building for the Harvey Company. And it's Hopi House at the Grand Canyon. It still stands today. This is a, a postcard rendition of that. Um, and Coulter went on to design the buildings at Phantom Ranch, Hermit's Rest, the Lookout, the Watchtower, Bright Angel Lodge. There were, there were many other um, endeavors after that uh, in which she was engaged. But you can see their brochure for El Tovar. They have photos of not the building, but um, Hopi uh, women with pottery. When they opened in 1905, and again in 1907, they uh, brought the uh, Hopi potter, Hopi Tewa potter, Nampeo, to demonstrate pottery making at Hopi House. And she and her family lived there. Her daughter, Annie, was also a potter. And her sons and her husband were there. Annie's children were there. Um, and this was remarkable for several reasons. Um, Nampeo was probably the first Native artist known by name. She was photographed as early as the 1860s. And her pottery was widely collected. And it was greatly appreciated because uh, it revived a shape from um, Sityatki and uh, designs that were inspired by Sityatki polychromes. The shape is very difficult to do. The jar flares dramatically from the base and it comes back in. And any of you who have tried pottery making know how hard this is to do. Uh, the designs were just beautifully, beautifully painted. And the Harvey Company made little tags with her name on it, uh, made by Nampeo Hopi. This was uh, really unheard of at this time for a Native artist to receive that kind of recognition. Here's a photo of her. They turned it into a postcard. Um, the pottery at the top gives you an idea of her very fine, uh, fine line painting. And the jar below it, what, or the bowl, I'm sorry, was collected by Mary Jane Coulter in 1904 um, and is now in the collections of uh, Mesa Verde National Park. Now, if you, um, oh, you don't have to do that. Um, there it is on a menu. They took the design and put it on a uh, Harvey Company menu and they put it on one of their books, one of their little booklets, the Indian and Mexican building. This is the same text that we saw that had the Zuni knife wing on it, just a different, a different cover. Um, our other artist demonstrators, Sam Pamahea, uh, here making katsina carvings. Katsinas were purchased by, um, from Frederick Boltz as early as 1900, 1901 in preparation for the um, Alvarado. And then in, in 1930s, uh, they wanted to do a postcard of a silversmith at the Grand Canyon. 
Uh, there was a Navajo silversmith who worked there at times, but he was not available the day of the photography. So Paul Sufke, um, a Hopi silversmith, uh, is he pictured here in this photograph, and you can see this beautiful third face Navajo textile in the back, and, and um, this piece in the back. So they staged a photo for, um, for a postcard, and there was a bit of correspondence about, well, we can't call him a Navajo silversmith, so, um, because in fact he was Hopi, but they did debate uh, how they were going to title the postcard. <coughs> And since he was there, they went ahead and they photographed him with a Navajo textile. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, the, the Grand Canyon, of course, has been a, a, a natural draw for visitors for, uh, for decades. Uh, Einstein was there in 1931, looking a little sheepish. <laughs> in, in the center here is Porter Tamichi. He worked for the Harvey Company in their gift shop. He worked there for about 50 years. He retired from the Harvey Company. And um, Taft was at the canyon in 1909. So there were a lot of people who, who visited the canyon. In 1915, um, the World's Fair was going to be in California, and two cities were competing for the fair, San Francisco and San Diego. And San, San Francisco won the option. Well, San Diego decided they would have a World's Fair anyway. <laughs> and so there were two fairs. And the Santa Fe, there's an ad that, um, that uh, promised two fairs for one fair. Uh, the Santa Fe Railway put a lot of money in both of these events. Uh, the Grand Canyon, and these are the two brochures that were published. The Grand Canyon um, had a motor, took you through, um, in San Francisco, you could ride through a motorized uh, car and visit the site. Um, it is thought that that was uh, influential on a Disneyland ride later. Um, and in San Diego, on what is now the parking lot of the San Diego Zoo, um, several people from New Mexico, including Julia Martinez, who's seen here, um, made adobe bricks on site and built a multi-story dwelling. And they lived there for several months and demonstrated pottery and dances. This is Maria, and this is her sister Anna, and this is Adam, and perhaps Popovi. Um, and they made, made pottery. Now this was before Maria was known, Maria and Julian had developed the black on black pottery style. So they had not established a, a name that the Harvey Company uh, could use in any literature. So essentially they were there um, unknown. And uh, you can see this postcard, this was, I'm sorry, this photograph was uh, used in a lot of the Harvey Company booklets. And Maria was not mentioned by name. She's got a beautiful polychrome jar there, and one uh, that's in the Herd collection today. And of course, this was the pottery that they um, that they went on to develop around 1918, and uh, then later Maria's photo was taken by the Harvey Company. And here's Julian there. So, um, oh, and Mary Jane Coulter was very involved with the design. <coughs> of the, um, the multi-story building in San Diego. So in 1931, she and Herman Schweitzer, here's Mary Jane in the middle, um, traveled to Mesa Verde National Park, to Cedar Tree Tower, and uh, in preparation to build the Watchtower at the Grand Canyon. It opened in 1933, and Fred Cabote, a young Fred Cabote, um, painted murals inside the watchtower. They are still there today. That's a, the color photo is a contemporary photo. Uh, he's seen here with one of the Harvey family members. And this is a, a beautiful page um, he decorated for the, the uh, park superintendent's guest book. Um, just a, a beautiful example of his painting in 1932. He also um, designed, they used his paintings for um, decks of playing cards. There are two sets of decks of playing cards. There were other um, 
other photos, other images and playing cards. And in the 1950s, and you can still see these today, in the Bright Angel Lodge, he painted um, murals, some uh, visitors to the canyon. He, he first uh, worked for the Harvey Company at the Grand Canyon around the 1920s. Uh, he did teles telescope tours, and later he managed, um, managed uh, a shop there for a few years. So La Fonda. Oh, we love La Fonda. Um, <laughs> The Harvey Company detours actually started, they were for a short period of time, but they have such a reputation. Uh, from around 1926, when um, the Harvey Company uh, acquired La Fonda, and of course Mary Jane Coulter decorated and designed the interior. Um, these are some of the women on the Indian detours. Um, I just love their jewelry. And I thought, well, what fun. Um, here's, whoops, let me go back. And on their hat, is this um, symbol, sort of a, another bird symbol used here on the publications. And this is some of the, the jewelry in the Harvey Company collection. Um, so the detours went to surrounding Pueblos. Um, here you can see the cars here and the pottery that was made for sale is visible in this photo. But I think this photo tells you the most about what this could have been like for the Indian detours to go to the surrounding villages. And they, they also went to Chimayo and um, some of the other sites. But just the impact that this could have had on a community, uh, both good and bad. Um, good in the sense of, of uh, people who were interested in buying, bad in the sense of uh, just the the invasive way that it might have felt. Um, and they designed the trains. They looked for inspiration uh, to Navajo textiles, you can see. And uh, there are uh, images here, based on, um, also based on Navajo culture. This is interesting because here's a big mural of um, artists working on the train as well as the, the textiles, and they were food stylists. I mean, do you believe it? They did everything. Um, this plate and the dishes are, um, are called a Membrino pattern. They were designed by Mary Jane Coulter in 1939. It's a little difficult to see, but here's a lot of them do have designs of um, animals on them. I just like this picture because I thought the food looked good. <laughs> and then um, we, this is the last slide that, I guess, uh, last part of the PowerPoint uh, with this beautiful brochure from La Fonda, which on, is on exhibit here. And the, um, the brochure draws from Pueblo cloud designs and, and imagery, and again speaks to um, just the way the Harvey Company utilize that imagery to promote travel in partnership with the Santa Fe to the Southwest, all the way to California. And I thank you for your attention and would be open to You know, I, I could do that, but I'm thinking that Deb Slaney is going to talk in uh, next, are you two months? It's two months. In June, and I think she's going to spend a good bit of time about that. Uh, all I can say is um, a lot of the hotels were based on um, Spanish style, there's Spanish influence in the furnishings, but I think Deb is going to go in more detail, and she's going to know a lot more than I know about that. So.
I've always been really interested about um, the Harvey locations in national parks. And I'm curious to know how they presumably receive permission to build commercial developments on what is essentially government land in national parks. Well, I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> um, it's, they had the concession. I don't know of the specific arrangements. That's a great question. Who owns the Alta Bar? I've been there many times. Who owns well, the, the Alta Bar is owned by, now by... Um, now it's owned by Zantera. Zantera. So the company was sold in 1968 to Amfac, which then became Zantera. So it's owned by Zantera. It was. Mm -hmm. But there are other buildings, uh, you know, there's Culp Studio at the Grand Canyon. Right. So there are other buildings. Well, and the Grand Canyon was not a national park until somehow. Well, that's true. It was 1919 19. when it became a national park. And so that they had already built El Tavar. Oh, they'd already built but they had El Tavar because that opened in 1905. But they so hadn't built the Bright Angel or the Watchtower. They hadn't yet built those, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I wish I knew. <laughs> I'm going to come over to you. Oh. I wondered, first of all, if the Indians were paid a decent amount for their artwork and how it changed their lives. Like, were those were the, was the jewelry ritualistic before it became commercial? And, um, you know, were, was there a lot, were there parts of the tribe that were really against having to make things for commercial reasons? Okay, so there, there are a couple of questions there. Um, the, the Harvey Company business was like a lot of businesses. They bought at a certain price and they marked up at a greater price. And some of that markup includes, you know, your personnel and having the lights on and, and <coughs> all of that. But there was a, a big markup in there, as there is in any commercial business. Um, they were, from what I can tell, not a lot of, uh, no, they were not paid a lot. And the markup was quite a bit. Uh, there, there have been some publications about that, specifically about textiles and weavers that have been written where uh, the scholar tried to look at just that uh, specific. In terms of jewelry being ritualistic, um, some of it has an important part in ceremony. Some of it is, is made for personal adornment. So, um, and in terms of uh, issues, I think there, are, there were um, things within communities that needed to be private and things that could be shared. So I don't know if the Harvey Company was fully aware of which things should remain private and which things should be shared. We hope they were, I guess. Uh, but I think there are, are, were times when, uh, when people were, maybe people were encouraged not to share certain, certain things that should be private. I don't know if I got at that at all. But. Did all of the um, Harvey hotels have the native tours? No. There were a lot of hotels. No, they didn't. Um, the tours left, um, the detours, which again, it was just for a short period of time. Um, the cars, the Indian detours, 26 to 29, I think, were the years. Uh, they left from La Fonda. I think they left from the Alvarado. Uh, there were tours from the Grand Canyon, but there were uh, a lot of other hotels, if you recall that, that map that just showed the dots all along uh, toward California, so no. I think they left from Las Vegas to New Mexico. Las Vegas Las also, Vegas. that makes sense. But mostly New Mexico and then the Grand Canyon. They weren't really outside of New Mexico much. Are there any more? Oh, I'm going to get this one in the back and then come down to you because we have time for maybe two more or so. You speak of the uh, Pret Harvard collection. Did the family acquire their, their collection entirely separately from the commercial interest? Were they two different things going on simultaneously? 
there were different things going on. Um, the company collection in great part was, um, was formed by Hermann Schweitzer and also Huckle. Huckle had a collection of textiles and his name is associated with quite a few textiles. That was held in the showrooms and in a storeroom at the Alvarado. Family members also collected. Catherine Harvey, who was a <coughs> granddaughter, I believe, had a lot of, uh, collected a lot of paintings. Her collection went primarily to the Museum of Northern Arizona. Byron Harvey III, who was a great grandson. Catherine's a daughter. Excuse me? Catherine's the daughter. Is a daughter. Of Are you one more generation? No, one more generation. Right. Yeah. So Byron the third would be the great grand. Great, right. Uh, Byron uh, attended the University of New Mexico and uh, was a very active collector and, and donated about 2,000 objects to the Herb Museum. So it, there were individual family interests and then there was the business. And Herman Schweitzer was very protective of that <coughs> business in the 30s. Uh, Huckle encouraged him to sell a portion of the collection to the Nelson Atkins Museum and, and he was very reluctant because he had hoped for a, another museum to be established. That's some of my favorite correspondence is that exact correspondence. It's Schweitzer is like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. <laughs> uh, I think there were two down here. Okay. I know in the interest of time, you showed just several uh, photos of Maria, Julian, and the family. Did she have a greater influence going into the 20s and 30s in terms of the prolific, the whole family, extended family, in terms of the amount of pottery that they were selling? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No, I was just showing them um, in terms of that, their, that one, that primary association with the 1915 exposition and how different it was for Nampeo, uh, whose name the Harvey promoted, whereas at the time Maria and Julian were, had not developed the black on black, and, and how the Harvey Company, if they had, they would have utilized that. So it was a, a little bit of a contrast. Yeah. But oh, absolutely, they were incredibly influential. I have a copy of your wonderful book at home that my wife has, has enjoyed as well. Given the interest in the Fred Harvey Company and all of its influence, are you considering some kind of update of the book? We, <laughs> we've been trying to reprint that book for 20 years. And um, now that, you know, there's, there's so much more and so much, um, well, my, my colleague Kathy Howard, who will speak here um, next month, um, has done so much more research that we would like to do a, a different version, an updated version, but we, you know, if we could find a publisher. So we'll see what, what happens with that. But, um, but we won't be re reprinting. It's unlikely we'll reprint in Bidding the Southwest. We sold about 11,000 copies, which in our world is a lot of copies. Let's go for In your, your slides, there were a number of um, insects of actual art, uh -huh. are those all from the Herb Collection? Um, they are with the exception of that Nampeo Bowl, which is um, at Mesa Verde National Park, and I really wanted to show that because of the way they rather freely um, use the imagery, the Harvey Company did. Okay. Do you want more? Do you want more? She asks hard questions. I don't want her questions. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Following up on the question that was asked on the other side of the room, I actually have a couple of pieces, supposedly, of Fred Harvey jewelry. And I've read, but I, I don't know how accurate it is, that the Harvey family and the representatives would go to the tribes and to the villages and counsel them on what to make. That, that so much of what was sold was really uh, almost a collaborative thing. So they wouldn't have been so much ceremonial as they would have been commercial. 
I know where that comes from. Um, actually, uh, it was Herman Schweitzer working with Hubble, and, her, and Schweitzer ordered quite a bit of jewelry through Hubble and would ask for specific things. Colors of textiles, send me more snake bracelets, uh, you know, it, this kind of design, not that kind of design. So more specifically, it was um, a business that was looking at the way things sold and then, uh, and then trying to get more of those things that sold that way. Um, and there was something else uh, about your question, but now I've forgotten what I was going to say. So. Okay. Well, can you help me thank that?